My name is Liano Marcus. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, cash collection and working capital. How many people we have in the room from like telecommunications or utilities? Do you have anybody from those kind of industries? Well, one arm back there. Well, good. Hope this is interesting for you in this case. Um, well, I'd like to, to thank um, specifically Mango Solutions for the great conference. It has been a pleasure to be here, some great talks. The food is awesome compared to some other conferences that we had the pleasure to go. Um, so uh, today I, I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, cash collection. I'm going to just do a quick introduction so that you get familiar with uh, the kind of work that I do and the kind of areas that I've been focused in the last couple of years. Then I'll introduce you to the business problem. Uh, and again, this is important for you to understand that the solution that I'm putting together effectively tries to solve a business problem and has been tested in the field. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about our solution and how we have deployed. And uh, I'll then finish with, with a case study. Uh, I'll leave some time for uh, questions uh, and answers at the end, as you can imagine. Um, I would like this to be very interactive, so if there is anything throughout the way that you would like to, to ask, you can stop me, otherwise you can leave all the questions for the end. It's really up to, to you, okay? So, uh, a little bit of, of, of my background. So, I, I've been studying economics and then a master in applied econometrics and forecasting in Lisbon, I'm Portuguese. Um, then I've done throughout uh, my career some certifications and courses, more practical courses around data mining, machine learning, and recently big data, uh, with a focus on, on Spark. Um, from a professional service perspective, I've been working uh, uh, in the last seven years, especially with, with Deloitte in Portugal and then London. Uh, I also was a researcher in Lisbon uh, one year. And, and finally, which is the most important thing, is I really practice analytics 24-7. Just to give you an idea, my girlfriend typically says that analytics is my girlfriend and she's the lover. That just gives you some, some context about the amount of, of uh, dedication that I put into the research field. From a, a, an R um, component, which is why we are all here, we all love R. I've been working with R for the last six years, six, seven years. Uh, I've built uh, several packages um, from pr uh, for the projects that we typically deliver and also for a research uh, uh, purpose. Um, of course, some of these packages are uh, not available for the public uh, domain for multiple reasons, uh, but I think the one on the sentiment analysis will be available probably in two months. It will be integrated probably with a, a current package that already exists uh, with some interesting features that I'm building through the thesis. The three areas that I, I've been working, uh, uh, two professionally and one on research, uh, is around cash collection, and I'm going to go into. Uh, a, uh, I'm going to make a deep dive into that. Predictive asset maintenance, what I've been working a lot uh, within the void, and then the, f the the final one, which is the topic of my thesis, social media impact on stock prices, um, which is something that I think it will become public uh, very soon. Um, through throughout this time, and let's hope this doesn't happen too much. I've been integrating R with uh, a lot of the tools uh, in, in the field, especially around quick uh, products and Tableau uh, from a visualization perspective. So that's all from an introduction. I just wanted to give you this background so that you can understand the type of work that I've been, I've been going through. The rest of the session, we're going to talk about cash collection. So, I mean, for those that never had, uh, uh, that, was ne that were never exposed to uh, a typical uh, working capital framework, you might look at uh, a company that essentially uh, invoices customers. And through the invoicing cycle, uh, a lot of procedures happen at the background. And for you to be able to predict that uh, SQL and that uh, process, you need to take into account a lot of, a lot of uh, elements. For example, uh, if a specific customer receives a bill, uh, he might have two options. He might rather pay or challenge that bill or make a call to the contact center and then challenge after the call. He may say the call is wrong, the, the, the bill is wrong because consumption is not right, or he may just wait to receive some sort of notification that is late on payment. After his late on the first payment, which you can imagine a company would send a bill after 15 days, for example, 
uh, you have another option. You receive the bill, you can pay, you can dispute, you can call and say the bill is wrong, or you can wait for the second uh, letter, which will then say, well, you're actually right. If you don't pay now, I'm going to send you to an external agency. And this can be repeated for so many times, depending on the backend systems and ERPs that you have, until you reach a situation where you don't expect that customer to pay. You actually have an exhausted debt, and you might write off that that debt. <laughs> is that is that clear from from the picture? Yeah. Okay. So within within this framework, uh, we uh, uh, thought about the different uh, complexities be be behind this process and come up with uh, a, a solution which gives uh, the customers the ability to tailor uh, their process to a modeling framework, then monitor uh, the performance of those models, make actions out of the models, and align those actions with their internal process, and then, of course, visualize all of this through a nice front end. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I don't want to feel. I don't want you to feel that this is a consulting presentation. I really want to go to, to the to the more deep uh, element of this. So I'm going to jump into the the, the, the solution that we put together uh, currently, uh, and and the solution that we, we will present as a case study as well is very similar to this one. So as as, as I as I presented before, there is many many different process that affects. Um, essentially uh, the cash collection process. Of course, if you look at typically the back-end systems that you have in place, you have uh, a payment system, you have a billing system. Sometimes the contact uh, systems are really on a different place, doesn't connect to the main, to the main systems. The disputes may be a completely different system. Uh, the customers that pay by direct debit may be a completely different system as well. So essentially, we had to create um, some sort of a connection to all of these systems and gather all that data. Uh, the way this was put together, essentially leveraged the R and some packages that connect to those uh, uh, systems and brought everything through some SQL statements. Uh, again, when we thought about this initial step, we always thought about this needs to be scalable. So at some point, if we need to replace R with something else, we need to write the, the functions and the code as more generic as possible. So if a situation occurs that we need to replace it, it's plug out, plug in from another technology but the time to actually change is very small. We're still not in that, in that place yet, but everything is SQL uh, driven, so if we had to put Spark R or, or anything uh, different, it will just be easy to do that. Uh, at the point where all that data is put together, and, and we, we had several challenges to implement this on, on a live scenario. Uh, because of many different things, different granularities of customers, different uh, ways of the systems to store data, IDs don't talk to each other, uh, so all that kind of nice stuff that you go when you're dealing with data quality. We created uh, after a, a single uh, customer view where you have data aggregated by customer throughout the time. And time here may be days, maybe weeks, maybe months. It really depends. You may even think of storing everything to a customer level and just keeping all the, the, the events at, at that level. So again, storage, nothing to do with R, but R is used to kind of gather all the data and put that data into a repository. We'll go into a, a detail uh, in a second to number one. After the data is in a single repository, we have to make some sort of, of decisions about what's the granularity that I'm going to uh, develop the econometric models. I'm going to use essentially data by customer. Can I use some sort of segmentation techniques to group customers with similar behavior and then run the econometric models on top of the, those segments? Um, and then when you start thinking about these things, the first thing you need to take into account is what exactly is the process that your client and your customer have? How do you make sure that you link the customer segments with the different departments and the way they are structured? So for example, if they have a uh, retail uh, department and then a, a, a B2C department, you might need to think about segments disaggregated as so, so when you drive actions out of the models, they can follow up and actually execute them uh, from an operational uh, perspective. So bear that in mind that uh, uh, all the segmentations that are put together really depends on the customer that you're, you're, you're working on. Um, finally, the predictive models, where essentially you need to think about what kind of 
techniques you have uh, available to, to deploy those models. I'm going to talk a little bit about exactly which ones we are typically implementing. Um, they are not uh, rocket science, and I'll explain why they're not rocket science. Uh, we actually tried some of the machine learning algorithms and some even ARIMA models, but at the point, at the point where you need to explain that to the client, um, it's, it's typically easier to go with some dynamic time series models, and I will explain that in a second. So again, typical framework uh, to go end-to-end. -end. We are leveraging as much as possible open source R and putting at the top visualization tools. In this case, this was not Shiny. By the time we developed this, Shiny didn't have the power that it has today. It was sitting on a quick dashboard, uh, but I promise to you that I will put this in Shiny next year. Um, so everything that, that comes from, from the data, models, performance, and monitoring of, of the cache collection process happens at the visualization layer, which is integrated with, with R. So again, the four areas I think I have already explained to you um, uh, what exactly they are, how exactly they, they are put together. We created a package uh, to do this, um, and um, I actually have here just some sort of uh, an explanation of what the, this, this does. So essentially, and this is very important, the package that I typically build are not uh, new algorithms in R, it's more wrappers around capabilities that we already have, document those, those wrappers on a nice way that we can use that in many different areas consistently. So if you have 10 techniques that you are applying, all those 10 techniques will have consistent outputs and consistent uh, uh, data that you can use in any front-end tool, Shiny, R, Tableau, or whatever. Uh, in this case, again, we have built several functions uh, as a result of that. Uh, it's, it's a package that has some nice uh, uh, um, interface with tools. I'm not going to go to that level of detail now, but I'm happy to go uh, and, and walk you through any questions that you may have with the package or the front end right after the, the session. So what exactly are the, the typical uh, econometric models that we, we, we have been deployed? So again, in cash collection, there is two main processes that we typically have to divide. One is the customers that don't have direct debit. So if you think about it, I don't have direct debit on my uh, utility for gas, for example. So I react to a bill. You send me a bill, I pay you. You send me a bill, I'll pay you. But for example, if you have a direct debit, it doesn't matter if I receive a bill or not. I know how much I have to pay by the end of the month. It's a regular payment that I need to make. So those two differences from a process perspective and from an algorithm perspective is very, very, very different. So we uh, have been working with this approach and dividing the, the algorithms and the econometric models into, two, into these two categories. On one side, we essentially focus the algorithm more on the billing element and then adding uh, on top of the, the, the billing, the dunning uh, uh, events that occur throughout the process that we know the company have, the contacts, and also some sort of uh, memory element, uh, and from a technical perspective also makes sense to uh, add the payments lagged depending on the time that you're using. Uh, it's just important from a consistent perspective of the algorithms. Then on the right side, we have a two-step algorithm, which essentially uh, works on predicting how much direct debit you are going to ask and receive, and then embedding that into the, the payments um, um, uh, equations. So I don't know. I, I think this is quite clear in the way that I'm, I'm, I'm explaining. But if you, if you have questions, please, please stop me. I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to answer them. So again, what kind of benefits that we typically are passing to, to the client is, is the ability to have a single source of data for the cash collection process. We typically give them a, a customer profile uh, for, for the payments. We, they are able to predict uh, the cash collection for a given period of time that they, they want and then make decisions out of, out of those models. What kind of decisions? So they might think about a specific customer group. If I reduce the time of the first letter that go out, what would be the impact on the cash collection on a given month? If I, instead of having three dunning letters, just have one, what would happen to the cash collection cycle? Okay? If I delay from 15 days to 20 days, what exactly would happen to my cash collection profile? If instead of calling you, I text you, what would be the outcome of that? Okay? So this is the kind of questions and, and, and actions that we've been uh, adding to, to this process. So the case study that I'm going to show you 
um, and I'm just going to go through the main results of, 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 of the process, uh, was on a, a water utility company in UK where they have provided all the data that pretty much we, we discussed in the beginning of the presentation. Uh, production plan, billing plan, initiative plans, some kind of what marketing uh, uh, events I'm going to add and I'm going to have. Do I'm going to try to add 100,000 customers to direct debit, yes or no? Um, we, div we created a segmentation model uh, combining their internal process, um, ended up with eight customer groups that they wanted to predict what cash collection will look like. Um, and I'm going to jump straight to the, to the, to the main uh, um, um, results. So we have this solution working over one year and a half from now. So you can see on top essentially how many times we have refreshed the, the models and sometimes we had to also change some of the underlying models uh, for many different reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons was we had some, uh, some ARIMA models deployed for direct debit and the client asked us to change that to dynamic time series so they could understand which factors were contributing more for each of those, those predictions so they could make, make decisions on top of that. So we had to change some of the underlying models uh, uh, throughout the way. Uh, but, I mean, what was interesting after we uh, analyzed the results after one year was that we improved a lot their ability to, to monitor and predict cash collection, so they are much more accurate. And on the, on the groups that they were not that accurate, which we had one group in particular, we were able to identify what was the reasons why we were missing uh, and our, that accuracy. We were able to understand what was the assumptions that we put through the model and why those assumptions was not working and then try to very specifically tackle those, those challenges of that specific model and those customer groups after we revised that, that model. Um, so uh, after one year, we, we overall had a, a, a one-year forecast accuracy of 1.19%. This is predicting in the beginning of the year and comparing the results at the end. This is not the models that we had updated uh, so that we could in, like effectively prove the accuracy of, of the underlying process. But this process is improving uh, over time, and we still can use R for the end-to-end -end solution. We are not at a, at a stage where the solution is not working or we're having problems. There is a server that has a lot of memory, uh, in this case, that is sitting underlying the solution, but is working fine, and we, we don't have plans to replace that in the, in the, near, uh, in the near future for now. Uh, well... This is pretty much what I what I what I had to uh, to present to you today. Uh, I'll then now move to to questions that you might have. I'm more than happy to uh, answer them. And if you have and you are curious about the front end solution or the package, we can we can also do it uh, afterwards. Thank you.